how do you apply EF core migrations in production? This is going to be the topic of today's video where we are going to do a deep dive into EF core migrations, generating SQL scripts from our migrations and exploring how we can apply them on our production databases. NAD Framework Migrations is an awesome tool that allows us to implement database schema versioning. We can describe our data model with c -sharp code and then EF Core is able to convert this into a respective database migration. We can then take this database migration and apply it on our SQL database. As part of this video, we are going to explore creating and customizing database migrations. We are also going to discuss the various ways of how we could apply database migrations on a production database. I'm also going to show you how you can generate SQL scripts from your EF Core migrations. And lastly, I'm going to mention some external tools that you can introduce into your process for managing database migrations. Now, how do we actually define our data models in C Sharp? Well, EF Core exposes a fluent syntax that we can use to express our data model. And this is an example of configuring a product entity with an EF Core database context. We can configure what is the table that this entity should be persisted in, what property is the primary key, what are the maximum lengths for various properties, we can define a precision for decimal values, and if we want to have a unique index, we can also do that through the Fluent API. If some of these concepts are new to you, don't worry, we're going to explain everything in depth, but this is a necessary first step for what comes next, and after we have configured our entity with EF Core, we can generate a migration. This is going to produce some code that looks something like this, and you can see that we are calling some methods on the migration builder instance. The first example is creating the products table and configuring the respective columns. We are also defining constraints on our table, such as the primary key and the check constraint that I put in place. And lastly, we are creating the unique index that I configured on the product name column. So this was the high level introduction into EF Core migrations. And now let's jump into the code and implement all of this from scratch. So this is my EF Core database context. And as you can see right now, it's completely empty. Inside of my program file, this database context is configured to connect to a SQL server instance. And now let's actually configure the one entity that I have, which is the product entity. You can see that this type is fairly straightforward. We have an ID property that's going to represent our primary key. And then we have the name and description properties and the price of this product. So let's go ahead and convert all of this into an entity configuration for EF Core. There are a few ways how you could approach this. The simplest approach is overriding the onModelCreating method where you can use the model builder and call the entity method and then you can specify your entity type. So I'm going to specify product and this allows me to provide a function that's going to give me the entity type builder. And I can use this builder to configure my entity with EF Core. So I'm going to start by calling to table and I want my product entity to be mapped to the product table. I can also provide another argument to this method. The one I'm looking for is to specify the table builder delegate. So let me specify the table builder and then let's configure our actual table. What I want to achieve with this is to add a constraint that we can't insert a record into this table that has a negative price. So I'm going to call this CK, which is short for check. And then I'm going to say price not negative. And then I need to provide a SQL expression that's going to represent my actual check. So what I'm going to do is provide the name of my column, which is going to be product price. And then I'm going to say that the price should be greater than zero. And this is a simple check that you can introduce to your tables. Let's go ahead and configure some of the other properties that we have. For example, I can set the primary key and let's say that the ID property is the primary key of this table. I can even omit this step entirely and EF Core will pick up the ID property by convention and configure it as the primary key for this table. The entry point for configuring individual properties is calling the property method. And for example, I can set the maximum length. Let's say that this is 100 characters. Then I can also configure the maximum length for my description. So let's select the description property and then I will call has max length and specify 1000. For decimal properties, you may want to configure what is the precision. So let's say that the precision for the price property should be 18 and 2. And I can call the has precision method 
and specify those values. And lastly, you can also configure a database index using the Fluent API by calling the has index method. You can specify one or more property names that should be indexed. And for example, let's say I just want to define an index on the name property. And I also want to say that this index is unique. This is going to introduce an index on the name column and it's also going to enforce a unique constraint so that I can't have two products with the same name inside of this table. So let's say I'm happy with my entity configuration and I'm ready to create my first migration. I will open up the package manager console where I can run my PowerShell commands. You can also use the regular console where you can use the .NET EF tool. The commands are almost identical and the command that you want to call is called add migration. Then you need to specify the migration name and let's call this the add products table migration. I'm going to hit enter and this is going to generate our migration file. So this is going to scaffold a class behind the scenes that implements the migration base class. It contains the up and the down method, which are going to apply and revert the migration respectively. And in the up method, you can see that we are creating the products table with the respective columns. We're also configuring our database constraints and creating the database index. In the other method, which is going to revert this migration, we're just going to drop the respective products table. Other than the migration file, this is also going to create a respective snapshot for your EF core model, which you can see here inside of the migrations folder. And this contains the current state of the data model for your database context. Now let's leave this in place and let me head over to the product entity. And let's say I want to update the description property from description into short description. So I'm just going to rename this property. And this is also going to apply to my entity configuration in the database context. Now, until I apply the respective database migration, this won't be visible in the database. So the first step would be to create the actual migration. I'm going to call the add migration command again and specify our respective name for my new migration. And this is going to be rename description to short description. So I'm going to create this migration. And then you will see that this migration file is much simpler. All it has is the rename column command, which is going to rename the current value description into the new value, which is short description. And then in the reverse step, we have a command to rename the short description into the description. And other than the name of the column, nothing else changes with our data model. If I were to apply these migrations on my database right now, they're going to be applied one by one. And EF Core checks which migration was applied using this value, which uniquely identifies this migration. So you can see this is a timestamp and then the name of your migration. So we're first going to apply the add products table migration and then we would apply the rename description to short description migration. All of this is controlled through our respective table inside of our database that checks which migration was the last one that was applied. So let's close this down and let's discuss how we can actually apply these migrations on our database. The most common approach is through the command line interface where you can just call the update database command and assuming that you have provided the respective connection string, this would apply any pending migrations on your database. You can also specify a specific migration that you want to apply by providing the migration argument. And you can also define your connection string through the connection argument. So this would be the command line approach. And this assumes that you have access to EF Core tooling. In a more recent version of EF Core, I believe it was EF Core 6, you have access to migration bundles and you can call the bundle migration method and specify a respective connection string to your database. And this is going to produce an executable file that's going to apply any pending migrations to the respective database. So this is very useful for environments where you don't have access to EF Core tooling, such as continuous integration pipelines. However, my preferred approach is generating SQL scripts from migration files. Now, before I show you that, I want to show you one more approach of how you can apply your database migrations manually through the code with the help of the methods that are exposed on the database context. So I will often create a helper method like the apply migration method here that accepts a service scope instance. We're then going to use this service scope to resolve a database context and then we can access the database facade and call the migrate method, which is going to apply any pending migrations. And how you would use this is when you are starting your application, for example, if I'm running in a development environment, I can use my web application instance 
to create a service scope and then call this method which is going to apply any pending migrations for this database context. While I often use this in development and inside of my integration tests, I don't recommend that you use this approach in a production environment because you don't have an easy way to revert any changes that you apply using this method. So that leads us to the last approach that I want to show you and this is generating your SQL scripts. So how you can achieve this is by calling the script migration command. Let's go ahead and execute that and then let's see what's going to happen. This is going to produce a SQL script which is going to apply your respective database migrations. If we examine the SQL script that you can see here, you can see that the first command is going to create the EF migration history table, which is how we can track which migrations were applied to this database. Then you can see that this is going to create a database transaction and is going to apply the first migration that we have to create the products table and define the unique index on the products name column. Then it's going to insert a value into the EF migration history table, which is going to specify that this migration was applied. Then we have another database transaction, which is going to execute the rename procedure that's going to rename the description column into short description. And then it's also going to insert a value into the migration history table. So this is only going to generate the migration scripts that are going to allow you to go from one state in your database to the next state where you have applied the respective migration. But what if you want to revert some migration? You can call the script migration command and specify what is the name of the last migration that you have applied and then specify to which migration you want to revert to. So let's say I want to revert from my last migration to the first migration that I have and I can generate a script for this and this is going to give me the steps to revert my last migration. So you can see that this is renaming the short description column into description and it's also deleting the record from the EF migration history table. What I really like about generating these SQL scripts is that I can verify what's inside of each script. I can make sure that the SQL is correct and I can also check if there are any operations that I didn't expect. If you have a dedicated database administrator, you can also give them the SQL script and they will execute this on the database. You have to be aware that some of these operations are expensive and they could lock a respective table into the database while it's executing the migration. In a high throughput environment, this could really be detrimental to the performance of your system. So at any point in time, you have to be careful what you are doing with database migrations. If you have a change that you want to apply to your database and you don't know a simple way how you can express this through the Fluent API, what you can do is call add migration, give your new migration a name, and I'm going to call this custom SQL. And this is just going to give you an empty migration file. And what you can do now is call migration builder and the SQL method. And this allows you to specify a custom SQL command that you want to run as your database migration. Now, in this case, you are responsible for the correctness of the SQL command and you're also responsible for being able to revert this respective migration. So you can see that EF core migrations are very powerful, but you have to know what you are doing. And now I want to mention some additional tooling that you can use to enhance your database migration management. So I want to mention some additional tools that you can use together with EF core migrations, or even use them to replace EF core migration entirely. And the first one is the Fluent Migrator Library that you can use to define database migrations using C-sharp code. This is very similar to what we were doing with EF core. However, this is a more bare metal approach and you can use these migrations to update your database. And then there are some tools that you can use for running your database migration scripts and they give you a very clear cut way of how you can execute your migrations. One of those tools is called dbup which is another c -sharp library that you can easily integrate into your .NET projects. A similar kind of tool is called Great, which is short for Migrate, and this is actually the successor of a very popular database versioning tool called Roundhouse E. So you can use Great to run your database migrations. You have to structure your, these tools rely on executing your migration scripts, so you can combine them with EF core migrations for generating the actual scripts, and then delegate the execution of those scripts to Great or DBUP, for example. And another popular tool that falls into this category is called Flyway, which you can also use for versioning your database. I'm going to leave the links for the documentation for all of these tools in the description of this video. And I want to quickly share five best practices for working with EF core migrations. So best practice number one is using meaningful names for your database migrations. Good examples are add products table, or rename description to short description. This would probably be even better if I named it rename 
product description to chart description to make it obvious which entity this refers to. Good naming conventions will make it easier for you to manage which migrations were applied to the database. Best practice number two is keeping the migrations small and focused. The smaller the migration files are, the better. It's going to be much easier for you to verify what is the change that you are applying to the database and if this is the expected change that you want to make. Best practice number three is testing your migrations before production. Ideally, you want to have an environment that closely mimics your production setup. This could be a development or staging environment where you can apply your database migrations and test that everything is working as expected before applying those migrations in production. Best practice number four is beware of destructive operations. An example of that would be the drop column command. And let's say I want to drop the description column in the products table. Why would I do this? In some versions of EF Core, this is how a rename command was executed. It will first call the drop column command and then the add column command to facilitate a renaming operation. And while functionally this achieves the same result, you go from the description into a short description column. The problem is by dropping the column first, you're going to lose any data that was inside of this column. This isn't the case with the rename column command, which is just going to rename the column in place and all of the data is going to stay where it was. So that was best practice number four, beware of destructive changes. And best practice number five is avoiding merge conflicts with EF4 migrations. This is an absolute headache to manage, so you want to keep it at a minimum. How you can do this is to always stay up to date with the latest migrations and you also want to delay the creation of your migrations for the current feature that you are working on to the last moment possible, ideally right before you create your pull request, for example. Let me know in the comments what is your preferred approach for applying database migrations. If you want to grab the source code for this video, you can do that by subscribing to my Patreon. Check out my courses about clean architecture and modular monoliths. And until next time, stay awesome.